Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, coming this afternoon. So what I want to do is uh, talk to you about how, we've, um, how we think about building uh, highly available, scalable, reliable service in Netflix and talk you through some of the thinking that we've evolved to around how to maintain it <coughs> excuse me, and um, test that over time. So um, about me, I've, uh, for the last several years, been at Netflix running the, the cloud solutions team. It's the team that handles the operations of the Netflix service, um, the Netflix streaming service, as well as building various pieces of the platform, you know, heavy focus on the cloud. Um, we're all public cloud. Um, we use Amazon's public cloud infrastructure for all of our service. Thinking about availability, and then uh, the open source initiatives that we have around uh, Netflix OSS, and I'll talk about that. And so that's what, where I've been for the last couple of years. And then last week, I actually um, switched over to the dark side. So um, left Netflix last week, and um, I'm going to join Scale Venture Partners as an investor to invest into many of the companies that we were looking at um, at Netflix uh, in the cloud ecosystem. But today, it's all about Netflix. So um, if any of you out there don't know what Netflix is, here's a brief little description. It's um, you know, the internet's leading TV network. Um, every time I do one of these presentations, I have to go in there and edit this because the number of members that we have uh, grows every time we release uh, any quarter. So now it's up to 40 million in 41 different countries, uh, enjoying over a billion hours of TV shows and movies every month. And uh, you know, recently, this year, Netflix started getting into original content and starting to produce its own uh, TV shows, series, and uh, actually earlier this week, movie, uh, a movie was announced as well. So this is some of the, uh, the titles that got released earlier this year, and it's been getting some, some amazing uh, reception in the media. Won uh, a couple of Emmys earlier in the year, and, um, and, and is really off to um, a fantastic year. So that's what Netflix is, and this is you know, another picture of what Netflix looks like that you know, I and the rest of my team tend to look at much more than, than the previous ones, which is it's a very large scale, complex, distributed system. This is a view of one of our monitoring tools that shows a topology view of what makes up the Netflix server. So when you guys interact with Netflix, these are all the different services and, uh, and systems in the back end. Each one of those is an actual service with you know, many different instances behind it and uh, the edges denote uh, connections and, and requests made between two different services. So it's very large scale, very complex, and you know, obviously keeping a system like that up and available is uh, a huge challenge. And so just to set some context, this is a slightly more sane view of what it is that Netflix is made up of. Uh, if you look at, you know, starting from the left, uh, the blue box is the consumer devices, all of the things that uh, you use in order to access a Netflix service. It could be an Xbox, PS3, an Apple TV, your phone, um, smart TVs, Blu-ray connected to uh, Blu-ray players connected to the internet. Um, Netflix is on over a thousand different consumer electronics devices, um, and all of those devices talk to um, the, through the streaming API to the service that's primarily running in the public cloud. So we use Amazon, as I mentioned earlier, as our public cloud provider. And um, all of that service is running in the cloud. Um, there's small little bits and pieces. You know, I usually say 100% with an asterisk. Uh, there's a couple of pieces around uh, billing and payments that are still in the data center that we're in the process of moving into the cloud um, later next year. Uh, and then, so everything uh, from the point of logging into the service to the point of uh, getting ready to play a movie is hosted out of the cloud. And then the last piece, which is actually when the play button gets hit and the movie starts streaming, that piece is served from the red box, which is in the past has been CDNs. Uh, and recently, as of uh, the middle of last year, we launched our own CDN, CDN initiative called Open Connect that is uh, used for streaming all of those bits to the end users. And so all of that is in order to get pictures like these, uh, you know, in order to provide the service, to create a highly available uh, system so that you know, people can pay $7.99 a month and, and enjoy the unlimited movies and, and TV shows that Netflix has to offer. And you know, these are the things that keep me and others on my team up at night when we have situations like this, which is when the service becomes unavailable and users can't enjoy the service. So availability is really, um, really important for us. And you know, just to ground the conversation, when we think about availability, we break it up into three different components. The first thing and the most important thing for us is can members uh, play movies? Can they stream the service? Can they actually use it for, for you know, what they purchased it for? Um, the next one is can we accept new member signups? Uh, those people who are interested in signing up for Netflix, can they go to the website, uh, input their credit card, and sign up for a new service? And then the last one is 
uh, new members who have signed up, can they activate new devices in order to stream? And so availability is, is like I said, really important. Um, but we know that failure is all around us. Um, there's really nothing we can do about failure, whether it's disks failing or uh, power going out, um, you know, software bugs get introduced in the development cycle, um, and you know, honestly, just people making mistakes. There are um, hundreds of different ways for things to fail, and failure is really unavoidable. Um, and so what we do as you know, software developers and, and, and uh, product developers is we design around uh, failure. And uh, you know, you can, there, there's a wealth of uh, resources out there for learning about how to design highly tolerant, um, redundant, resilient systems. And you know, when we built the system, that's exactly what we did. You know, we put exception handling in the code. Um, you build redundancy so that when a particular server or a particular instance fails, that doesn't affect the rest of the service. Um, you know, we built fault tolerance so that uh, remote requests that fail have fallbacks and so on. And all of this is in order to insulate our users from uh, failure that happens all the time. And you know, the question that I'll put out there with kind of rhetorically is, is that enough? And you know, the, my, my assertion is that that's not enough. Uh, and the reason that's not enough is because that's a very static way of looking at software development. It's something that you do during the design phase and then you forget about it. And how do you know whether the things that you've done in order to ensure your resiliency, in order to ensure your fault tolerance, um, whether they're all actually working as you continue iterating and as you continue um, building new features. And so what is it that, you know, what's the next step? What can we do in order to protect ourselves? And you know, there's a typical answer uh, for this and anybody wanna wager a guess at what the typical answer is? <laughs> Pray, I like that, that's good. Um, users are uncomplaining now. Uh, testing is usually what, what you hear. You know, testing is, is usually the way that you solve this problem. How do we know whether things are working the way that we designed them, the way that we built them? Well, you test it. You, you, know, you put in unit tests, you put in integration tests, stress tests, and you, know, you try to exhaustively simulate all the different ways that uh, your service can break, and you put that into your development cycle so that as you're coding and developing, you're ensuring yourself that um, you know, your service is, is working really the way that it's, it's supposed to. Uh, but can we really effectively simulate and test a large scale distributed system? And my assertion is that it's, it's hard, uh, it's very hard, um, because you know, on the one hand, just building the system itself is already hard. If you have scale, and you know, for Netflix's case, Netflix accounts for about a third of all uh, internet bits that get delivered downstream during peak. Um, so it's got a lot of scale. Um, being able to simulate that in any kind of test environment in a realistic way is, is very hard. And you, know, you heard about Jason this morning talking about how you know, if you wanted to build a, a cloud platform, you probably could. It'll take you eight years and some really smart engineers. So you know, these things are possible, but they're really hard to do. And these are some of the things, uh, some of the reasons why uh, testing uh, becomes really difficult at scale and, and with a, a large amount of complexity. Uh, you know, massive data sets, um, internet scale traffic, the interactions and the information flow in a distributed system is um, you know, by design, by nature, asynchronous, and so it's very, very time dependent. So being able to reproduce that and test that is very hard. Um, you, know, you have external third-party services that make it hard to, to replicate. And then you know, the thing to remember is that all of this has to happen while you're actually delivering your product and while you're bringing innovation to market. And so it's prohibitively, prohibitively expensive, um, you know, if not impossible for, in certain cases, um, for, for doing this for, for large-scale systems. So you know, what else? What else can we do? Well, what if there was a way that we can reduce the variability of failures happening? The biggest problem with availability um, and the reason why it ends up biting us so often is that it comes from unexpected places in ways that we didn't think about. Well, what if there was a way that we could control how, when failure was happening? And that's exactly the way that, that we uh, designed it. And, and um, that is by causing failure to happen in a more predictable and in a more repeatable way, you reduce the unpredictability of failure happening. And so if you can actually make your system fail all the time, then that gives you at least a little bit of confidence that you're able to withstand unexpected failures when they do happen. And the real goal is that unexpected failures really get treated as non-events because you have so many expected failures already happening in your system. So that's exactly what we did at Netflix. And we built this you know, lovely group of characters that we lovingly call the Simeon Army. 
And the Simeon Army's goal is to induce failure and to cause things to fail in our production environment um, all the time so that we can give ourselves the confidence and the certainty that the design that we've made uh, in order to be resistant to these types of failures actually works in the real world. And so let me walk you through a couple of the more interesting uh, parts of the Simeon Army. And so the first one is um, uh, trying to produce the failure of instances failing. And again, instances, this is one of the most common types of failure modes that we've seen. If you're in the virtual world, in the cloud, uh, you know, this is, you know, you're thinking of instances. In the physical world, you're thinking of servers. But in any case, the unit of execution uh, fails, whether it's because of bad disks or you know, a host of other reasons. This is the most common failure mode. So to address that, we built a tool called the Chaos Monkey. And this is probably the most famous out of the, uh, the Simeon Army characters that's been written about quite a bit in the media. And the idea behind the Chaos Monkey is, you know, imagine uh, you know, a, a monkey that's loose in your data center that's going out there, you know, pulling out cables and breaking machines. And that's what the Chaos Monkey uh, is, is supposed to do. It operates during business hours. And so we're guaranteed that there's going to be engineers in the office when one of these things happens. And what it does is it randomly shuts off uh, instances. So these are you know, real production instances that are taking live customer traffic, um, takes them and uh, essentially does a, a hard shutdown on them, not a clean shutdown. And the expectation here is that it has absolutely no user impact. Because if it did have a user impact, then we would treat it like any other type of outage and we would mount a, um, you know, an incident response uh, immediately. But having this run in our uh, environment all the time makes us know that if there was an instance that failed because of some bug in Amazon or because some disk crashed somewhere, that this wouldn't really affect the way that our service is running because we have these things uh, failing all the time. And you know, we've had, um, you know, I forgot the exact number right now, but it's over 60,000 uh, instances that were killed by, by Chaos Monkey in its lifetime. So, what did we learn from Chaos Monkey? Um, well, the first thing is that state is a really bad thing. And you want to be able to get rid of state as much as you can and abstract it away into another service or, or another component that you can deal with in a different way. Uh, you know, state is really what makes exercises like this very difficult. If you're holding session state, if you're caching things on an instance, then when you take that instance out, that request, that user request that gets rerouted to another instance when it gets retried, either has to rebuild all that state or just fails. So state is a really bad thing um, that, that we, you know, all of our services, uh, the majority, I should say, of our services are designed to be stateless. And then there are other services that encapsulate state um, that have their own uh, resilience and redundancy characteristics that allow them to deal with failure, uh, things like Cassandra, for example. And clusters is really the best way to be able to deal with these types of failures. Um, you know, within Netflix, we don't deploy any of our services on single instances. Everything is deployed in a cluster, which in the Amazon world is an auto-scaling group. When a new service gets deployed, it gets a new auto-scaling group, and that auto-scaling group gets provisioned to be at least three instances in size, one across three different availability zones. Um, and that's for the smaller services, and then obviously the bigger services have you know, hundreds and thousands of instances uh, serving them. And so when one instance goes away, that request can be you know, easily rerouted to another instance that can handle all of that traffic. And lastly, you know, surviving the single instance failure is, um, it's good to be able to do it, but it's certainly not enough because there are many other more complex failure modes that we've seen. And one of those is that you, know, you have one instance failing, it's bad, but now we have a lot of instances that fail because of some correlated event. It could be a data center power outage, it could be something happened with the entire rack, it could be a network uh, gear that's you know, letting traffic in and out of your data center all of a sudden became unavailable. So this is a whole other case of uh, failures that Chaos Monkey doesn't let us capture. And for that, we upgraded Chaos Monkey and we built Chaos Gorilla. And so Chaos Gorilla is intended to, uh, to do to uh, Amazon availability zones what Chaos Monkey does to single instances. So it sh shuts down entire um, availability zones for Netflix and uh, makes sure that the remaining availability zones can handle the capacity and the traffic um, as well as the functionality of the zone that just went away. So Chaos Monkey, uh, sorry, uh, Chaos Gorilla is, um, you know, at this, uh, the goal for us is to run Chaos Gorilla in a fully automated way. Uh, you know, still haven't gotten there yet. At this point, we run it once a quarter. 
uh, in you know, a somewhat manual way where it's a set of uh, you know, scripts that go off and actually orchestrate this. And then we have people sitting there and watching and learning what happens. And then there's some, you know, there's some really interesting uh, learnings that actually come out of this every time we run it. And uh, you know, as you can see, much more than, than from Chaos Monkey. And some of them is, uh, are that you know, the deployment topology is often masked when uh, systems are running that you don't really fully appreciate until you run some of these failure drills. You know, we've seen situations where um, you know, instances um, weren't, instances weren't, um, they weren't wired to talk to instances in other availability zones and we never found that out until we created one of these uh, failure cases. Um, the infrastructure control plane was one thing that we actually found to be a bottleneck sometimes, and this was a really interesting one, where um, you, know, you wouldn't think that uh, you know, tearing down thousands of instances and bringing up thousands of other instances in other availability zones would be something that causes trouble to the service, but in fact, that is a hard problem, and you know, sometimes it's not that easy to just bring up uh, you know, thousands of different instances uh, at the click of a button. Uh, the shifting of the traffic was something that was really interesting uh, and, 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 and uh, identified some uh, failure modes for us where, you know, the load balancers, uh, we had to modify the policies of the load balancers to expire sessions more quickly and to be able to handle really large scale um, events like this in a more sophisticated way than the naive approach that we used in the past for handling single instances that were, uh, that were failing. You know, one interesting example of this is that we had, um, you know, we had a service that was essentially our directory service for the entire world, uh, for, for all of Netflix, where uh, it holds um, the, uh, the service and then which instances uh, uh, execute that service so that when you want to talk to another service, you ask the directory service, you know, which instances can I talk to, and then it gives, it gives those up. You know, and we, we had put in a, um, you know, essentially a protection mode for this, uh, this service that when it notices more than 20% of its uh, instances disappear, it goes into this self-preservation mode so that um, you know, it wouldn't uh, wipe out all of its uh, directory when there are network partitions. What we found in this case is you know, because we killed a third of all of our instances since we run in three availability zones, that triggered this self-preservation mode in our directory service and it continued sending traffic to the zone that we just killed and essentially black holed all that traffic. So again, one of these things that's really hard to find unless you run um, these kinds of drills and these kinds of exercises. And then you know, the last uh, maybe, maybe um, shining star there is that we use Cassandra for all of our persistence and Cassandra worked beautifully. It works exactly as uh, we expected. And, you know, we, we have it partitioned uh, across three uh, uh, availability zones. When one of the availability zones went away, the other two availability zones continued handling all of the traffic that, uh, that, that got rerouted to it. And then when, when the zone came back, you know, the hint and handoffs all got passed on to uh, those Cassandra nodes and everything just worked beautifully. So Chaos Guerrilla was, was a great step forward for us, but we kept thinking, what about bigger? What if larger parts of our system go away. Um, and you know, things like Sandy, for example, that took out the entire uh, you know, eastern data centers and, and, and entire regions. Um, you know, how do we protect ourselves against that? And for that, we have another Simeon, which is, which is a Chaos Kong. Um, we haven't run it yet, but, uh, but we have plans to run it, uh, depending on who you ask, either in the coming weeks or in the coming months. So sometime very soon, we'll create, uh, we already have Chaos Kong, and we'll run it, which uh, will take out an entire region and make sure that other regions um, in a globally distributed way can handle all of that traffic. So that's instance failure, and that's failure in general. But there's another type of failure mode um, that is a lot harder to deal with. Um, and and you know, to describe this, it's, it's best to talk about an analogy, which is you know, during the days of hand-to-hand of -hand combat, there was a widely held belief among generals that it was better to wound enemy soldiers than it was to kill them because wounding them would uh, create a tax on the enemy that they would have to care for all of their wounded that was higher than, uh, than the enemy soldiers that you killed. And it's similar in software systems where if you have services, instances that are unhealthy, that aren't cleanly failing, it's a lot more difficult to deal with it, it's a lot more difficult to detect, and it's a lot more difficult to uh, remediate. And so we wanted a way to be able to simulate and to deal with that. And for that, we created Latency Monkey. And so what Latency Monkey does is inject an arbitrary network latency 
into a client-server interaction, either on the client side or on the server side, either for, uh, for a single client-server path or for uh, a service to all of its clients. And then we observe the behavior uh, and make sure that there's no customer visible impact. So network latency is one thing that it injects, and the other one is it can also simulate um, arbitrary error rates. So for example, we can say that a particular service will have 30% uh, 400s, will return 40% 400s or 500s, and the rest of the time it'll return 200s. And so that enables us to see what happens when services become degraded, when they're not completely unavailable, but they're somehow not healthy. And this was a difficult problem for us to deal with. And so before we actually put this into production, we built a component that we call Hystrix, which allowed us to withstand failures like this in a way that would be mostly insulated for our customers. And so what Hystrix does is essentially create a, a use a circuit breaker analogy. And you know, let me walk you through this somewhat complicated flowchart, where you know, on the left side you see uh, a client that's making a service call to some kind of remote service. It goes into a queue, and then when it's working normally, it goes through the circuit, it gets run, success is returned, and then that success gets passed back onto the client. While all of this is happening, we monitor the latency of each one of the successful requests and the percentage of the errors that pass through the circuit. And when a trigger gets hit, for example, latency goes above some threshold, or error rates go above some threshold, then that circuit flips into an open state. When that circuit flips into an open state, it doesn't go and actually make the remote execution to the service. Instead, what it does is serve up a fallback. So an example of this is Netflix has a movie recommendation service that are personalized. For every user that logs into the system, we have a service that generates a recommended list of movies for that user based on a whole sophisticated slew of algorithms. If that recommendation service becomes unavailable and we can't generate a list of recommended movies for the user, the fallback is to return, let's say, the top 10 most popular movies. So that the user doesn't get as personalized an experience, not as good of an experience as using the, uh, when the service is available, but they're still able to continue using the service and the unavailability of that service doesn't completely make the service unavailable. So once we had Hystrix, then um, we started running Latency Monkey and now we have Latency Monkey running as well. And there were some really interesting things that, um, that Latency Monkey taught us. Um, so you know, understanding what the dependencies are of a service that's running is, uh, you know, is the best use of Latency Monkey, and, and that's what it really helped us highlight. But the surprising thing that we weren't expecting was that there's a whole host of dependencies that services have when they're bootstrapping, when they're just coming up. And that's hard to detect, and that's hard to be able to deal with. So for example, when we run Latency Monkey in a period when we're scaling up, so we're going from, let's say, 10 instances to 15 instances because we're expecting more user traffic. Then if we run Latency Monkey, those additional five instances that come up don't have certain dependencies that they can talk to. And there are some in really interesting modes that uh, they get into where if they don't have access to those um, dependencies during startup, then, uh, then become basically non-functional uh, even after those dependencies come up. So this helped us highlight some of those things, and, um, and finding those startup, uh, startup dependencies was, not, was a side effect that came out of this that we didn't really expect. Um, so the ongoing and unified approach, I think, is something um, really important to highlight, which is that you know, running this once is good, and it's useful, and it helps you identify things that you should fix in your architecture. But running this on an ongoing basis is really important. Because as you, know, as you all know, code changes and, and, and new features get rolled in, it's very easy to have uh, new dependencies creep in that we didn't expect. And so running this on an ongoing basis is really something that helps us identify those. And then unified is also very important. And the reason for that is that having something like this and having uh, dependency management makes your service much more resilient. But what, what could end up happening if you're not aware of what the entire service is doing is that you're now serving a degraded experience to your users because some services are, are unavailable, but you're not able to monitor and to alert on it and to actually remediate it so that your service is degraded, um, but you don't realize it and you don't recognize it. So having a way to unify all of these different things that are happening to the environment 
is something that's very important. The last thing that, um, that I'll mention when it, uh, for the Simeon army is this concept of entropy, which is that you know, a, a system in a state you know, increases its level of chaos unless something else acts in order to, uh, to clean it up. And what we found is this is very true in our, in our environment, especially where uh, in a cloud environment where resources are so easy to, uh, to procure and to, and to acquire. And so you know, what this leads to is that clutter starts accumulating within your environment. And this is bad for a number of different reasons. One is it just makes your system more complex. And just the degree of complexity increases as you have more stuff that's running there. Um, you, know, you have old cruft that's you, know, you built and released you know, a year ago that's still sitting there and running. Um, security vulnerabilities was another uh, big concern for us, which is that you know, we have services that are sitting there that we deployed a year ago that might have you know, an old version of the OS, an old version of Apache that never got upgraded, and there's just security vulnerabilities sitting out there that, um, that are getting unpatched. And then obviously, cost is something that's uh, important for us as well. So as, as you have all of these resources accumulating, they're all um, accumulating additional cost as well. So for that, we created the janitor monkey. And the janitor monkey does exactly what you think it does. It cleans up uh, the cloud environment. And it uses kind of the traditional garbage collection uh, techniques of mark and sweep, where it goes first and uh, marks all of the resources that are running in the cloud environment and identifies which one can be reclaimed based on the age that they were last deployed and based on a lot of other heuristics that help us identify whether resources are still being actively used or not. And then a second phase goes and sweeps and then reclaims all of those resources. So if there are instances, it goes in and shut, shut, excuse me, shuts them down. Uh, you know, with things like EBS volumes, it'll go and delete the EBS volumes, um, obviously sending email to uh, owners that, um, that these things are happening. So you know, with, with, um, with Janet and Monkey, what we learned was we need to label everything because it's very hard to identify what something is when you're trying to you know, look at it after the fact that it got deployed and you're trying to identify who needs to be alerted that this thing is going to go away. And you know, clutter really does build up. Um, you know, we, this this ends up, ended up saving us quite a bit of money, which wasn't the initial motivation for, for building it, but ended up being a wonderful side effect. And so this is what the rest of the Simeon army looks like. Um, I won't go through each one of these, but there's a blog post on uh, the Netflix tech, tech blog that talks about each one of these. Uh, you know, they, they, they range from uh, failure exercises to um, uh, tools that essentially keep our cloud running in, uh, in a clean and um, compliant way. Two other points that I want to highlight uh, around failure and injecting failure into your environment. The first one is that observability is so important when, uh, if you're going to be considering doing something like this. And it's really important for two different reasons. The first is that the last thing that you want to have happen is you're going through a real uh, customer impacting issue and then you have these uh, you know, nefarious minions in the background making things worse. Um, you want to be able to have them not run and not um, do any damage when there are real issues that are happening in your environment. And unless you're able to detect that and observe that in your system, you won't have that capability. And then the second reason is that this is a really powerful strategy we found in order to understand how our system, how resilient our system is. But its real power comes in being able to learn from every time out of that a failure does cause customer impact. Even though the goal is for customer impact to never happen with these exercises, once in a while that does happen. And unless we have the deep insights, monitoring, and visibility uh, in order to understand at a very deep level why it failed, then the value of this um, diminishes. And then you're really just causing customer pain. The second point is that there's a few organizational elements that make a strategy like this much more successful. And that is that in our environment, every engineer that builds services, that develops code, is also an operator of that service. And so they're the ones who deploy that service into the production environment, and they're the ones who get called in the middle of the night if there is an outage. And so running these kinds of failure exercises really creates a tight incentive loop for those developers because they're the ones who get paged and they're the ones who have to respond. Um, and that makes these exercises much more effective. 
And you know, the key there is that we don't use these exercises as a way to identify who's doing a good job and who's doing a bad job, but rather as a, a, a mechanism for learning and for creating a stronger and more resilient system with, you know, the end goal is really to create this learning organization that evolves over time. So that's the Simeon Army, and that's failure, um, and that's how we look at uh, improving the availability and the resiliency of our system. The last thing that I want to touch on is, um, you know, this, this, the Simeon Army is part of this overall cloud platform that we've had to build in order to run our large-scale service. And what we've done is made it available to the open source community through Netflix OSS. And so I want to just touch on a couple of things there to let you know about those. Um, and so these are, this is a list of uh, the various open source projects that Netflix has released. Um, it really goes to um, highlighting the fact that, that there's various pieces of infrastructure that's available out there in a public way. But in order to create a platform that abstracts that from application developers, there's a lot of pieces of it that are missing. And so the directory service that I mentioned is one of them, which uh, is called Eureka. Um, Etta is another really interesting one that uh, essentially uh, captures all of the history of configuration that uh, your cloud, your environment goes through and allows you to query it and allows you to understand exactly um, what changed and when. Um, you know, the monkeys are on there. Asgard is another really powerful tool that we've built that is essentially a, uh, a control um, UI for being able to do deployment and management of various uh, services that are running in the cloud and abstracts away the notion of uh, underlying instances and really treats everything at the service level. And so all of this is, you know, are things that, that we've um, open sourced and that are available. And you know, we, we sponsored this cloud prize in order to try to stimulate the um, adoption and, and development of these open source components. And so this was $100,000 of prize money that Netflix gave away for the best contributions to Netflix OSS. And the winners are going to be announced next week at reInvent. And so this is what you know, the OSS page looks like. It's at netflix.github.com. And I would encourage all of you to go and, and, and check it out. So that's all I have. Uh, you know, the takeaways that I'll leave you with is that Regularly inducing failure is a great way for making sure that your service really is as resilient and as highly available as uh, you think it is and as it's designed to be. And we've built this uh, relatively large platform for helping our developers run this, uh, this service that we've made available uh, to the open source community that you're all welcome to try. That's all I have. Thank you. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Fascinating talk, especially as a Netflix user, to understand this is behind it, it's, it's really mind-blowing. Uh, my question is, uh, you did mention many of the services are on uh, Amazon, but you mentioned that the streaming service is not. The streaming service is on Amazon. What, what I was saying was, you know, back in, um, you're probably referring to this, let's see if I can get back to it. Um, this slide. So everything that's in yellow is running inside of Amazon. And so that's, if you think about it as a user, everything from, um, you know, let's say you're, you're uh, using this on your smart TV, from the point where you click on the Netflix application to logging in to getting your list of recommended movies, browsing the different movies, um, and then picking the movie that you want to watch, all of that is in Amazon. And then once you actually click on the play button on the movie, and the movie starts, you know, buffering and then streaming, that is done from uh, CDNs and from OpenConnect. No, Amazon does that for their own services as well, right? They're, they're able to stream uh, content directly to end users. Why would you want to do separately from what, uh, why wouldn't you do that also on Amazon? Why don't we do that on Amazon? Yeah. Uh, we feel that that's something that we need to control in order to create a better user experience. Okay, all right, thanks. Sure. Hi, so I was curious. Um, you control, of course, all the pieces on your side, and the closer you get to the user, the harder it gets. Uh, you have ISPs that could throttle you, or they could have a line that's just not fast enough that they're not interested in upgrading. Uh, it works when you have five users, then 10 log in, and it stops. So how do you handle that? How do you detect it? What do you do about it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, this is uh, you know, by no means a complete solution. 
Um, you know, there's only certain kinds of things that you can simulate and that you can inject yourself, right? There's, you know, Amazon itself, like, you know, the hypervisor in Amazon failing is something that we can't simulate, although we've had plenty of experiences with that happening. Um, so, yeah, so this is not a, a complete solution, and, and everything that we're trying to do with this is make it more and more comprehensive so they can create more and more real-life scenarios. But at the end of the day, you really have to have a really good monitoring system and, and a really powerful alerting system to be able to know when the rest of your system isn't functioning. And so, you know, in the case of ISP throttling, you know, we monitor bit rates that, uh, you know, all of our users get, uh, yeah, both in, at an individual as well as an aggregate basis. Um, and so we can detect when, you know, certain ISPs or certain regions or certain countries are experiencing uh, problems. And then, you know, we have alerting um, thresholds that help us detect all of that. Okay, thanks. Sure. Are the slides online? Uh, I think, so these are very similar to the slides of the presentation I gave at OSCON, and those are online. Yeah. Yeah. Is it uh, Netflix or Friday product? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so we've spec'd out and built uh, physical boxes, and um, we give them away to ISPs who want to interconnect with us. Are we using SDN in our infrastructure? So, I mean, we don't use SDN um, in, in, I mean, in the traditional definition of SDN, but I mean, we do have load balancers and we do have directory services that essentially keep a real-time view of what our environment looks like. So our load balancers know, uh, you know, which regions are healthy and which instances are healthy and when Nothing software-defined networking. It's all IP-based, um, and you know each instance has an IP that gets registered with a directory service. The directory service knows for a given uh, service which IPs service uh, are available to uh, for that service. So let's say you know our personalization service will have let's say 50 different uh, IP instances behind it. When some of those go bad, they get taken out of the directory service and don't get handed out to new clients. Right. There's nothing that, um, that we're, the question is, are we thinking about going to SDN? I'm not sure what problem it would be, it would be solving for us because we already have the ability to route around failures uh, in, in, a pretty, in a very low latency way. So we don't, really, we don't really have a need for the network to reconfigure itself around uh, failures because we're doing it at the application level. They do to some extent, yeah. Although they really expose everything uh, as just IPs and, and uh, host names. Please use the microphone as the comment from the side. What do you use for monitoring data? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, how about I repeat the question? What do we use for monitoring what? Infrastructure. What do we use for monitoring the infrastructure? So we built our own monitoring system that we're hoping to open source next year. It's a system that we internally call Atlas. Um, we looked at a lot of different monitoring systems out there and we couldn't find anything that could um, handle the scale that we needed to. You know, our monitoring system handles you know, at different times between half a billion to a billion metrics per minute. And so being able to find something that can handle that was, was challenging. And we've gone through several iterations of you know, uh, scrapping and rebuilding our monitoring system as you know, every 10x or 100x that we've increased. Other questions? In the back, do you want to use the microphone? No. <laughs> All right. We're recording it, but if we use the microphone, I'll, I'll repeat for the stream. Yeah, Netflix open source. That's a great question. So Netflix open source, is it only for the cloud? Uh, and when cloud, I assume you mean public cloud, um, or can you run it on an internal infrastructure? Um, what we've built is a platform for running on top of Amazon's public cloud. 
but we've built it in an abstract enough way that it can be leveraged for private cloud implementations as well. Um, we aren't going to be building that, but others um, are encouraged to and are, build, are going to build, uh, excuse me, are uh, contributing to that as well. So we've had, for example, Eucalyptus um, contribute back um, to Asgard and to the Simeon Army for being able to run on top of Eucalyptus. Um, you know, other large companies are using Asgard to run on top of OpenStack. And so there are uh, multiple implementations of some of the components, but Netflix, for Netflix, we're running on a public cloud, so we're investing in making that work on the public cloud. Thanks. Other questions? Still got a few minutes. Hello. Uh, when you do these large-scale tests, do you coordinate with Amazon so they know what the heck they're doing with shuffling all the traffic around? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, for certain ones that we do, we do, yeah. So when we do things like Chaos Gorilla, which, um, you know, in effect, tears down thousands of instances and brings up thousands of other instances, then, uh, yeah, we do let them know. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much.